This is Rob Turbot for Boxing Social in association with Betfred. Delighted to be joined by Shane McGuigan. We are down here at the lovely McGuigan's gym in Leighton. Yeah. How are you, Shane? Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, mate, as well. Long time no see. Nice to see you looking healthy. So, uh, yeah, 2022. Let's do it. Absolutely. Yeah, I think the last time I saw you was Joshua Usyk Fight Week. Yeah. So, September... I remember December, January. Yeah, so it's been been a little while um good christmas yeah good christmas i went away i was planning to go away after christmas um till the first week of january but with all that covid stuff i pushed it forward of five days or something so we were yeah me and taylor and my girlfriend we were away for quite a long time so um yeah it was nice though mate nice sun um didn't really celebrate much christmas but because it was a bit weird being out in the heat but no it was really nice to get a break recharged and ready for a big 2022 Ready for a big 2022, indeed, a lot of twos in there, look, it's been a long day, <laughs> been ready for the 2022, and your stable continues to grow, and you've, it's grown last year, and every time you come in here, it seems to be getting that much bigger, so plenty on for you this year, I think starting with Lawrence Okoli defending his WBO title, is that right? No, you've got Adam Azim and Hassan Azim, Carol, it's, it's, it's difficult to keep up at the minute. Well, we've got Caroline that's potentially looking to get out on the 5th of February. We've got Ellie Scottney. She's just been announced to go on the undercard of uh, Ryder versus uh, Danny Jacobs at Ali Pali on February 12th. On February 19th, we've got um, Adam and Hassan Azim on the undercard of Kel, uh, Kel Brook versus um, Amir Khan. And then February 27th, which, which is a Sunday show, we've got Lawrence Headline at the O2 Arena and... Um, that's that for now but we've got a couple quite a lot of people scheduled out in March as well um, but that's the, that's the thing I've got nine fighters at the moment and um, got one in on trial and could end up being ten um, you know it's, it's everyone's everyone's flying everyone's busy um, it's just the weekends of the year are going to be dropped right down and uh, not going to have a lot of free time but look, I'm, I'm doing something that I love and um, it's hard to say no to talent, and the gym is full of talent. It's full of people wanting to come into into the gym, talented fighters. And uh, when you love what you do, and that's obviously what what I've I've been in it quite a long time now, even like 11, 12 years. But I'm still loving what I'm doing, and it's uh, my ambition still stays the same. I still want to train as many world world champions as possible. So um, everyone's getting getting good time. Everyone's getting equal time. My days just I start earlier and I finish later and um, people that come in and they're closer to their fights, uh, they get the priority of the better time slots, but it's, uh, it's, it's working smooth for now, so happy with it. Let's try and work through this in some sort of order. Caroline Dubois, you mentioned there, uh, potential for her to be on the February the 5th, Eubank Jr., Liam Williams, undercard in Cardiff. Um, first and foremost, I mean, she's not made a professional debut yet, but obviously she's somebody that you've worked with for about a year now, there or thereabouts, sort of in some... A little bit on and off. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, she, I think she came, came to the gym in Feb, uh, January, February last year. That's when Dan first came in for a trial. Then he went off and did some work with Jimmy and Mark Tibbs. And then once he came back, it was around May. So um, Caroline's been in. She was at the Olympics, but, you know, she's, she's been in since the Olympics. And, um, you know, she, she only wanted to go with one person. And, and I'm thankful for that. I feel like I've, I made an impact on her straight away. And... Um, yeah, I'm really excited about her debut. I think, you know, she's she's probably going to start around 9-11, 9-12, something like that. And then we'll see where we go from there. But, you know, the, I think for, for us, we wanted to potentially start a super featherweight, but I think we might just start at, at lightweight because that's, uh, that's where all the action is. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, she's she's progressing really, really well. And I'm excited because even though she didn't have that her, her debut, um, late last year and it got pushed back because she got ill and stuff she got a chest infection which was really a big disappointment but at the same time it's given us more time to, to work together and I feel like she's going to really make an impact um, when her debut is you know, hopefully we're going on February the 5th that's subject to Cardiff's regulations and being able to, to, to get it approved but um, be a great bill for her to make a debut and, and I'm excited for the noise you know, I think she's a uh, she genuinely is going to be a star in female boxing and she's got the potential to do so much outside of boxing as well. Um, you know, she's a good looking girl, she's very marketable 
and um, yeah, I think uh, it's, it's exciting times. How quick are you looking to move out? I spoke to her, something that we've always spoken about, you, you are always somebody who likes to push fighters forward, to push fighters forward, give them good opportunities to step up. She's somebody who, you know, while still relatively young, so good experience as an amateur, and we know the female code isn't as, as deep as the, as the men's code. How quickly are we going to be looking to push Caroline Dubois forward this year? Well, I feel like we just got to take that, you know, um, take that step by step. You, you, you never know. They can do all arounds in the gym, sparring and training and pads, but sometimes the occasion might get to them. It might take a little bit of time to get used to the small gloves, to get, to get used to sort of being out there under the lights, having, being critiqued by fans and being critiqued by, um, you know, pundits and stuff like that. And all of these things can, can play a factor in, in and a tribute to the speed that we move her. But, you know, she's only young. She just turned uh, 21 the other day. So we're in no rush, but at the same time, you know, uh, as you said, there's not, a, there's not a lot of depth within female boxing. And, you know, I reckon Ellie will probably be fighting for a world title around her sixth fight, fifth, sixth fight, something like that. So I don't think we'll go that as quick <clears throat> as we did with uh, Ellie. I think we'll go a little bit slower, maybe eight, 10 fights. but that still gives us a year and a half, you know, um, in the pro ranks. So our contract is, I think it's like five fights, five or six fights in year one. So let's just get her busy, get her active and, um, and just build into it slowly, but f full of talent. Um, and I think, you know, she's time because she's still a bit younger. It's time to sort of grow into her frame and, and, and get strength, um, you know, and, and get strength on the inside a little bit. But, but once she's, once she's matched with any girl, I believe she, she'll she'll be able to overcome them. It's just timing you know, for us to, to work together. You mentioned Ellie Scottney there. It's actually the first time I've ever interviewed Ellie Scottney today. She's an interesting character, uh, bringing a lot of uh, life and uh, vibrancy to the to the gym. What's it been like having her in the camp? Obviously, you've you've had a fight together, but she's now bedded in, been together about what, four or five months now. She's been there. It's all for me. I'm I'm losing track of time. Um, <laughs> it feels like she's been in the gym quite a long time. Lovely, lovely character. Great personality, good kind heart as well. Uh, does does things like that. You know, make sure everyone's everyone's happy. Goes around, and if someone's had a bad day, she'll go over and talk to someone. It's 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 nice. She's got a good good aura about her. Um, and yeah, I think you know her being out on February 12th is is great. You know, we were going to try and get one last year, get get one again last year, um, but you know she cracked her nose a little bit and uh, sort of set us back. So. Yeah, with the whole January thing, it pushed her fight back to February 12th. But look, she's probably going to be doing a 10-rounder, which is um, it's a big step up. You know, it's her fourth fight. So she had an eight-rounder last time. Let's get straight into 10s. You know, she's got fantastic fitness. We're still deciding whether we're going to do 122 or, or 118. This next one's going to be at 122. And, um, and then we'll... Oh. Just picking it up there. Um, light stop to play. Yeah. Um, Ellie Scott knew between 122 and 118, I think, is where we got to. Yeah, I think we're going to try and you know, trial the, the next one at 122, but we might end up competing at 118. We'll see where her body goes uh, and, and how easy she does the weight. Do you know what I mean? So um, 122 won't be a struggle at all, but we just need to sort of, you know, she's work, She's going to start working with nutritionists and, and you know, Try and try and stay on top of things, but yeah, fantastic talent. And next one will be a ten rounder on February twelfth. The next weekend, oh, it's, it's quite nice. It's staggered, so we can work our way through it. The Azim brothers return to action. I uh, want to go back to last year, of course, the debut of Hassan Azim and uh, your first fight with Adam. Uh, I think he's now three and zero, two and zero, three and zero, two and zero. So his second fight as a professional. Um, first of all, what did you make of their performances? I wasn't able to be there, unfortunately, but it looked like they brought um, half a slough with them, as yeah. I think we'll probably see that moving forward. Yeah, I mean, you're part-timer these days, so I would expect nothing less. But, um, yeah, it was Adam's second fight, uh, first fight with me. Knockout, looked the part, did a backflip, wore the shorts, had the support, 750 people, nearly 1,000 people, I think, turned out to, to buy tickets from them, for them. So it just shows what sort of support they've got behind them. And uh, it was nice to see Hassan, even though... Yeah, he tried to make his debut before things were getting rescheduled with COVID and stuff like that. So, getting his debut out of the way, and um, he only did a, he was only scheduled for a four rounder, and he'll be scheduled for another four rounder on February nineteenth. But um, he had about sixty seconds, not even that, forty seconds of action. Um, so hopefully we get a bit more time next next time. But look, progressing all the time in the gym, 
21 and 19 years of age, so, that, so they're young, um, time's on their side, they're in a good environment and they're learning all the time. And more importantly, they're, they're nice kids that are marketable as well. So it's, uh, I'm, excited about, I'm excited about their, um, their journey moving forward. Obviously, both of them, but particularly Adam, have come with a lot of, I don't, don't want to say hype in sort of a detrimental word, but there's a lot of buzz, should we say, around both of them. In your role as a trainer, when you've got two young kind of kids, really, who have got that kind of opportunity on Sky Sports, big platform, a lot of buzz around them, how do you, does that change or affect your role as a trainer with kind of pushing them, dragging them back, or does it depend on each in particular fighter? Just it depends on their weight division, you know. If, the, if it's a stacked weight division where there's a lot of depth within it, within the division in, in the, the domestic sort of um, sort of scene, you know. For instance, in a lightweight division, there's not that much depth there, but in welterweight, there is. You know, there's a lot of guys there in and around that weight. You've got the Chris Congers of the world, you've got McKinsons of this world, all those sort of guys. And then, you know, it, it's a, we're going to have to take things a lot slower with, with, with Hassan. You know, he he's also not done the development. He hasn't had the, the hard spars. I mean. Adam was 18 years of age and doing six to eight rounds with Luke Campbell and sparring. You know, that's that's when we started sort of. Well, that's when I saw him. I thought, wow, this kid's got this kid's got a lot of ability and, and he's a special talent. So, yes, there's a lot of hype behind him, but rightfully so. You know, I've had him sparring people like Conor Ben, and he's just been in the mix with a lot more, a lot more sort of uh, uh, established fighters. So. Um, they both got loads to learn, though, and they've both got time on their side. So, um, yeah, we're, we're going to take take things step by step. But I think within uh, the, the contract that I'd st structured with Boxer, we're pushing Adam on quicker. Um, and Hassan will be on fours and then into sixes and then into eights uh, next year. So, uh, but if we feel at any time that Hassan's ready to get going and, and fight for titles, we'll, we'll push him on. While we're hovering on the subject of Calm Brook, obviously they return on that undercard. What do you make of the main event? Obviously, long, highly anticipated clash. It's kind of come around eventually, should we say? Um, what do you make of Calm Brook? Excited about it. Um, even though they're both shells of themselves, you know, they're not they're not the same fight as they were. Let's not make no mistake about that. But it's still a great grudge match. You know, the two of them are got so much needle. They've had needle for years. They don't like each other. Um, Sky is the best platform for them to be on when it comes to hyping it up as well. It's nice to see the clips of uh, Khan out training, and you know they've sent someone out to go and watch them train, and and um, they they're documenting it well and they're building it up. I like I like it. It's uh, it's it's good. It's 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 where it you know it's good that it's also in the UK as well, and um, and you know people have made it happen. So I'm excited. Even it's way too late. <laughs> But, you know, we said the same thing about Pacquiao versus May. It was way too late, but it's still everyone tuned in to see it. Um, and I think everyone will tune in to February 19th to watch it. I don't know, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of strict st stuff in the contract to say that uh, Kel can't rehydrate a certain thing and there's a weight at a certain weight. And um, I don't know if it's... And that's the sort of stuff that w we as fans, especially people that are in boxing like myself and, and you and I, that's even got us excited. So, oh, you know, if it was no sort of cap on the limit, Kel would come in really heavy, probably favour him. But the fact that he's now coming in a little bit lighter, Amir's taken himself out to a good sort of a, a good gym. Um, that's not me just being disparaging towards Dominic Ingle. It's like it's just he's he's taken that step to go and really prepare properly, which just gives us it gives it more gives us more sort of excitement about it. Kel's back with his original coach and Dominic Ingle, who knows him inside out. So all of these things, like they're not the same fighters that they were, but it's making it exciting. So I, I'm uh, I'm excited to watch it, and I definitely most of the time when my lads are on, <laughs> I'll. What I'll do their fights and I'll just dart off. So, but with this one, I'm going to make sure I've got a seat. Yeah, I'm very excited as well, and I don't really believe anybody who says they're not. Uh, yeah. For whatever reason, I think yeah, everyone will be excited, particularly come fight week. First face off, yeah. insults start flying, pay per views start rolling in. Um, if I had to push you for a winner, who would you say wins and why? I'm still changing my mind all the time. Uh, a few years ago, I would have said Kel Brook had more left in him, but that Crawford fight really didn't show. It showed that he didn't have much in him, and you know, uh, I don't know the, the the weight bringing him down as well. Get so lean, you can't get that lean as you get older. Weight's going to favour the Khan, speed's going to favour Khan. 
punch resistance used to favour Kell Brook, but he looked a little bit fragile in his last one. I still think it, fav it favours him. Power favours Brook. I think if Brook can get through the first six rounds, I think he's, uh, he's, he's, he's probably going to stop him late. So I'm going to go with Kell Brook. Okay, interesting. Right, next week after that, Lawrence Okoli, uh, well, first of all, it's on a Sunday, obviously February the 27th, I'm assuming at least that no clash with the Josh Taylor fight on February the 26th. Was that a, a significant part of, of putting that on a Sunday? I didn't put the show on, but I, it's probably got some form of, uh, yeah, decision making behind it. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, that's, it's Catrell, isn't it? Taylor versus Catrell, yeah. So that's, that's going to be... Um, Lawrence in the O2, you just don't really want to clash, and it, it makes no difference for us if we're on the, on the 27th. Is, is that a bank holiday? It's a weird one, but if it was a bank holiday, then it, then it might make sense. But um, yeah, I'm excited about it. You know, Lawrence is headlining, rightfully so. He's uh, he hasn't he didn't headline in his last one, obviously, because uh, he was on, on the undercard of AJ Usyk. But he's back headlining. It's at the O2 Arena, it's in his hometown. So the fact that people are now going to be able to go out and buy tickets, like the last one he headlined was Gowacki, it was behind closed doors. So, yeah, excited. Um, the new and improved Lawrence of Coley, the one that is much more exciting. There's less holding and there's less, you know, it's uh, there's much more cleaner work. It's, it's He's exciting to watch, and I think Seslak is is going to be perfect for that style. I think he's going to walk him onto shots, and I reckon he'll get him out of there within the mid-rounds. Toughest fight of his career so far, do you think, for Lawrence? On paper, I would say so. I mean, it's just like he lost to Makabu, but I think he, actually, if you watch it, I think he beat Makabu. Um, and good boxer, you know, good boxing brain, good IQ, not the tallest. And that's going to be the factors that Lawrence is going to be able to take away his advantages because Lawrence is so big. He punches over, you know, he's, he's able to hit you when you're, when you might think you're at long range or out of distance, he's still nailing you. Um, with a guy that's not sort of compact and physically strong, like, you know, that's going to sort of close the range, um, I think says that's going to be standing at a distance, and that's why I believe, that's why I'm so confident that he's, he's going to take him out of there. Lawrence tweeted, I think a week or so ago, that he wants to dip his toe into heavyweight and he wants to move up there. We've spoken about it over a period of time that it's kind of a it's when, not if he moves up yeah. to heavyweight. How long do you think he's realistically got? Do you think this is his last year at Cruiser? I think so. It's going to be hard to get the whole undisputed um, title because um, with Canelo dipping his toe in it, potentially at cruiserweight, if he beats Ilunga Makabu, then that belt becomes vacant. He won't hold on to it for very long, or he might, um, and he might have no intentions of then defending it. He might go back down to like heavy, and then you're like you're waiting all the time on that w WBC. So. Um, it'd be easy for us to get the winner of Egorov versus Glomarian. It could be easy to get Bradis, but you know it's, he's also got uh, aspirations of moving up to heavyweight. So let's see. Let's just see where we're at. But if we sit sit around waiting for everything to like all the stars to align to get all those belts, we might be here for years. So we're not going to do that. We're going to go and make sure that. That this Lawrence Sokoli's decisions are, are, are made for Lawrence Sokoli, not, not waiting around for other people. So um, unify is the most important thing. If we can get as many belts as possible, fantastic. If not, we'll move up. You mentioned Myris Bredis there. He went to the tattoo parlour the other day. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, got himself a Jake Paul tattoo. Um, just your initial thoughts, really. Well, you see my reaction. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a fan. I just, it, whoever's advising that guy, I think they need to be shot. Um, that's a joke, obviously. Uh, you never know with this day and age if people take things a little bit too <laughs> too literally. Uh, no, I think you know it's it's silly. But Jake Paul's a he's a gimmick. You know what I mean? He's going to fight guys that are are gimmicks as well. You know, or guys that are shot to pieces. So he's fighting shot to pieces MMA fighters. Never mind shot to pieces boxers. Marius Bradis is still an on top one of the best fighters in the in the world at his, at his weight. You know, he's he is on paper the best fighter at 200 pounds. Um, Jake Paul might be competing at 200 pounds, but really, if you're actually training him properly like a boxer, he should be at 168. You know what I mean? Like if he if he was if he was properly on weight, you would say he's a he's a 168, maybe a 175, but he definitely shouldn't be a you know 200 190 pounder. Um, so I don't know what he's doing getting that tattoo. It's, it's abysmal. 
What do you think happens? Do you think we ever see Lawrence Okoli versus Myris Bredis? And how, well, what I want to know is how close has that fight come? I know there's been some talks of some description, but how close, if at all, have you been to making that fight? And if not, how do you think we'll ever see it? I'm not Lawrence Okoli's promoter. You know, Eddie's got his, his own ideas. Um, I know that that fight can get made and it hasn't been made. So, you know, we have to see it. And I want it to happen. Lawrence wants it to happen. You know, it's, it's like different networks, different, it's different promoters involved, but you can get things done. And, you know, I get it. Every promoter has their ideas of what they want that person to do. And maybe it's not the right timing. We need to build him up a little bit more. We have to get him a bit more exposure. And Eddie's doing a fantastic job with so many fighters. He hasn't done the best job with Lawrence in terms of, from an exposure standpoint. He, you know, Lawrence is a, he's a, he can rap, not the best. <laughs> <laughs> He'll hate me for saying it, but he still puts himself out there to do it. You know what I mean? He, he puts himself out there to, to take fights like Matt Yaskin straight away. And that was too soon, but he still won it. And now he's won a world title and he's looked good in his last three fights, four fights. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> and he's winning, he's knocking people out. And he, He's, going, he's, set, he's, up, he's up for selling a fight. If you put Marius Bredis and him he, head to head, he's going to tell him what he thinks. He's going to tell him how he's going to knock him out. He's going to play the game. And also, I believe he, he, he's able to go through and do it. So, um, yeah, it's, hopefully we can get that fight made. It would be a shame to see Bredis stepping up to heavyweight or even Lawrence stepping up to heavyweight and none of them gets that fight. Do you think Lawrence is going to have to go to heavyweight to get that exposure, to get that additional attention, as it were? Um... Maybe because the, the general public only really take interest in, not only, but the general public, especially in places like America and stuff, they, they don't care about cruiserweights. They care about heavyweights. You could be a, a low, not low level, but a sort of mid-level heavyweight and still make a lot more money than certain champions at, at cruiserweight. It's just the way the, the, the world works. It's strange because in UFC, there would be probably zero discrepancy between their version of cruiserweight and heavyweight. You know what I mean? Mm. It's, it's just different. But it's just the way that, that weight category has been marketed over the years. It's a, it's a new weight division. It came in, I think it came in in like the 80s or early 90s or something like that. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a shame, but it doesn't really matter. Lawrence has got the frame to go up to, to heavyweight, and I think he's going to make a lot of noise when he's up there. From... Well, one cruiserweight to a heavyweight, Daniel Dubois, of course, um, slightly further along now in his, um, his development under your guidance. Um, had a couple of fights with him last year. What's the plan for him this year? As I understand it, the Trevor Bryan fight is the one that certainly from your side you guys are looking to make. Is that the most likely opponent for him? Yeah, whether it's, whether it's the next one or the one after, I think we're going to get Trevor Bryan. So um, something going on with the WBA. They've, they've stripped um, Manuel Char. Mm. Um, out of his position, so Trevor Bryant has to fight on the January the 31st with another opponent, but maybe Frank or uh, Frank and Don King can sort of sort something out and give that guy some step aside money so we can get it get it going. Hopefully, we can get it on in March. If not, he'll he'll have a warm up, he'll have not a warm up fight, but an, another keep busy fight, and then we'll get it after that. So. Yes, it's a WBA regular belt, but still, it's a, it's a version of a world title. People forget, you know, like Scott Quigg was a WBA regular champion, and he's still a world champion. You know what I mean? And um, it's just it's just the way it is. When someone like Usyk or AJ went before, he had that, that WBA super champion. You know, it's, it gives us a chance to get a world title, get us in a position to then fight for the other belts and um, puts him in position of power. So I can't wait for him to get that opportunity. Um, he's improving in the gym. It, it, you know, you've seen him today. It's, it's nice the fact that we're not documenting it every two seconds. I'm not putting videos out of like the before and afters and stuff. It's, it's nice to see he's gradually speeding up. He's working on certain things and um, he got two, two knockout wins last year under, my, under me. One in the first round, and the other one in the second round, I think it was. So we had only three rounds, <laughs> three rounds of action. But you're going to get that with Daniel because he's so heavy-handed and he's so explosive. So, um, but he's getting the rounds in the gym and he's improving all the time. So when the when the moment happens at, in a, in a big fight, we're ready to go. 
How far away is he? So say he beats a Trevor Bryan, who I think with all the greatest respect to Trevor Bryan, is, you know, he's not Joshua no, he's not Fury, really. he's not that level. How far, or how far away do you think Daniel is before he's challenging those, those top guys at heavyweight? I spoke to him earlier, he's still very keen for the Joe Joyce rematch, which is something else that we've spoken about in the past. What's the plan for him this year? Do you think he'd be, by the end of 2022, start of 2023, ready to fight those top guys in the division? I think so, he's ready to go now. Yeah, you know I mean, he's, he's only 24, but he's been in the game quite a long time. Um, if he beats Trevor Bryant, which I believe he will, then why don't we t why don't we fight someone like a Derek Chisora or someone that's a, a well-established name? Do you know what I mean? Um, and then we've also got the likes of Joe Joyce. That's but he's probably waiting for his shot at, at the WBO. These belts, if if AJ versus Usyk doesn't get sorted, then Usyk's either going to want to fight Fury and then. With all of the governing bodies, it, you can't keep on to them forever. You know, the belts are going to go, become vacant, and um, especially if people like AJ are still around because governing bodies, they, they, they look after one thing and that's, that's themselves and it's money. You know, and if, like, if a guy's sitting there defending it against one, one person, they might go, all right, well, he's actually not generating. Like Usyk, he's not going to generate the same money that AJ was generating. Even Tyson Fury, he doesn't generate the same money that AJ does. So if he owns one belt, the governing boys will well, maybe try and get that other guy that was making us all that money. Maybe we'll try and become vacant so then we can get he, him to win it again or somebody else to win it and then make these mega fights afterwards. So it suits them not to have a champion that holds all. Um, so that's why people get, get, get stripped of titles. Now, we haven't spoken about Joshua Usyk, but I know you have spoken to Ryan and Andy um, since then. So let's talk about the potential rematch, as it were, Joshua versus Usyk. If that fight does happen again, what does Anthony Joshua need to do in the rematch that he didn't do in the first fight? He knows what he needs to do. Everyone knows what he needs to do. Not try and play the long game with a guy like Usyk. You, know, you have to go and impose your physicality, impose your size, uh, set high pace, have no respect for him. Don't be touching gloves, don't be taking selfies before a fight. You know what I mean? Go and, go and mean business. Usyk, like, he's, a, he's a master of not just boxing, of like, mind games and tricks. and you know, someone like Tyson Fury, he's, he's got it. He gets it because he's the guy that plays the tricks as well. So he w he would never have, you know, played those games and like, oh yeah, let's get a selfie or let's do this and that. It's like no, there there's can't be any respect for someone like Usyk. You know, you have to obviously after the fight, you respect him. Obviously as a as a person as a champion, like you have to respect your opponents, but you have to train like you you don't care about him. You don't you don't want to be his friend. You don't want to have any form of communication with him all you want to do is destroy him and with that mindset then you come in with a ruthless mindset and, and you're going to push yourself to limits you know i think he's changed he's doing the right thing he's changed up his team that was it's a decision he should have made a long time ago um, i don't know who he's going with but you can't have three or four coaches in the one corner i hope if he moves forward i hope he does it with the right person and that's not, not even. That's not me trying to tell it. Say me, myself. There's so many fantastic coaches out there. It's just get the right person and give that person your your time. Yeah, you know I mean, don't go with someone that isn't established. Go with someone that 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 can like that after five or six rounds can tell you what you need to do and switch it up. You know what I mean? Um, and that that he respects because if he doesn't respect the person, then he won't adapt to the instructions, you know what I mean? Or, or he'll be doubting their instructions. And I think that's something that he's, yeah, that's happened in the past. He's doubted people's instructions that are within his camp. And then he's looking for other people's advice outside the rinks. Like, they don't need to do that. You should, you should have reassurance from the person that's telling you it because they're the one that <laughs> is the person that's in charge of your camp. So if it, if it happens, if he's able to get that, that all together and, and, and lock that all in, then I think he, he wins the rematch. Yeah, you know, just looking at his size and his stature and his punching power, his speed, he has everything to beat Usyk. Usyk's not like he's not an invincible guy, um, and I think if he gets that all in place, he does it. If not, he'll get outboxed again. Not um, pointing this towards you, obviously. We're talking to Joshua, but it's just kind of coming to my head to, to ask you about it. Would you ever work as a team of three or four? Or if somebody wanted to bring in extra coaches or we wanted to add something to the team is kind of the way that it's been packaged over the last few fights of Anthony Joshua. In your role as a trainer, how would you feel about something like that? I 
don't know if I'd do it now. I would have done it when I was early on in my career. I don't know. I've got my team. I've got my team that I'm, I'm, I'm loyal to, like Pritchard. Do you know what I mean? And, and like, I think... Um, I, 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 wouldn't say, I wouldn't say no, but I'd have to say, like, well, if, you, if someone like him was going to employ someone like me, it doesn't even matter if it was Canella that wanted to employ me. Like, so how could you, how could you get your point across? if you've got some other guy that's going to, like, say if I want someone to box this way or, or then the other person's just saying, no, nah, actually, I think you should do this and that. And it's just like, it just becomes messy. You've got, you've got Ben Davison who's going out there who's being part of, like, four coaching team or three coaching team with, with Devin Haney. I was like, how can you really get that point across? Like, you know what I mean? It's like, where it has to, there has to be one voice. There has to be one person that's working with that person, not even just from a tactical standpoint, it's from a conditioning standpoint, from a pad standpoint, demonstrating things, technique standpoint, sparring, listening to one voice, tuning into one voice, and then you go out there and perform. And if that one voice isn't right, and you're not getting the results with it, then you change your team. But you don't do it and say, I'm going to listen to four or five voices. It's like, everyone's going to have mixed opinions. You just mentioned Ben Davison there. I was going to come on to this towards the end of it. Um, did an interview with, with Steve Bunce on BBC Radio 5 Live where he made some comments about the standard of British coaching, um, British trainers. Uh, obviously, you're a British, well, Irish trainer. Uh, I had to get that in there. Um, just wanted to know your thoughts, really. I know you would have seen the comments and just how you feel about them as, well, as a peer or somebody who works in the same industry. I think they were directed probably at Peter Fury. I think Peter Fury did an interview that was directed at Ben and he might have directed something back at Peter. But you can't put all coaches into one bracket, you know what I mean, saying we're lazy or something like that. I mean, it's easy for, for him to say people are lazy when other people have done a lot of the work. Like, for instance, myself with Josh Taylor, I spent five years ingraining the technique into that guy, making him the best possible fighter. You can't go wrong with Josh Taylor. Like you've been, you're inheriting a unified world champion. You know, you've got these... People are listening to him, so good fighters are listening to him, so he knows what he's talking about when it comes to boxing. But when fighters... I'm not going to say they're ready-made because it's disrespectful towards him. It's not like they're, they're ready-made. Like you can fine-tune fighters that have technique ingrained. Do you know what I mean? Like they, you don't need to go turn the shot up because they're already learnt. You know what I mean? It's like, I fine-tune George Groves. I don't take lots of credit for that. Like Adam Booth turned, told him how to turn the shots over, do certain things. It's like, but with, with Frampton, I, I years of just ingraining that technique in. You know what I mean? Josh Taylor, years of ingraining that technique in. Uh, Chris Bowen Smith, years of it, just ingraining it. When you got guys from the start, and that's why people like Caroline, the Azims, anyone else that, at least got anyone else that comes in from the start and they get success that's those are the those are the valuable years and even before that someone like josh taylor like terry mccormack did loads of great work with him before i even got him but it's from going from the pros to the world title to the unified world title you know it's like this is the that's that's years of work you know and for him to say other people like, like peter fury did years of work with <laughs> with tyson fury you know you can't and Jimmy Tibbs did loads of work with, with uh, Billy Joe Saunders. It's, it's, it's disrespectful to talk other people. I know he's getting his back up. That's what's happening because every time he puts a tweet out, everyone goes, oh, yeah, Shane trained him or Thingy trained him or whatever. You're just a poacher and stuff. And he has a very powerful network of, <laughs> of people behind him getting all of these fighters to come to him. But he also is doing a good job with his fighters. The best job he's done is probably with Lee Wood. You know what I mean? Because he's took a guy that wasn't performing to performing. So, yeah, but don't get your back up. I had it, I had it in the past. I've had it in the past where people have criticised me and critiqued me and said, oh, this and that. You know, you're only here because of your dad and stuff. It's like, but I don't get that no more because I've been in the industry a long time. You know, the longer he's in it, the, pe the less people are going to call him those names and, and stuff. But just... You can't let yourself. You can't let the ego get the better of you. you. Just you got to just go. All right, people can say what they want, and old coaches might say certain things. Like Peter Fury might say something about Ben, or John Fury, or or I might say something about Ben, or anyone, whoever's like, or Mark Tibbs or whatever might say something about Ben. Just forget about it. Just 
just brush it off. Do you know what I mean? Just get on with it and let the results speak for themselves. And he's doing a good job. You just don't need to get your back up. Like, if you get 100 comments, don't pick the three comments that are negative. Pick the 97 comments that are positive. Do you know what I mean? And that's just the power of social media. People get, get overwhelmed by it. And it's, it's, a, it's a negative... It's, it, uh, when, you're, when you're under the limelight, and it, it was sort of under the lights and in the limelight, sorry, you get a lot of, get a lot of haters, but you also get a lot of positive people saying nice stuff. So if I have any sort of words, I don't rise to, to other things. Just, it, you know, you've got to just take people for what they are and, and just keep doing it. He's doing a good job, as I said numerous times in this interview, but, you know, don't get your back up because someone else has said something. You know what I mean? Picking it straight up. Yeah, going to try and get you out of here soon. Um, appreciate your time today, as always. Uh, we have skimmed over the now former British, but Commonwealth and European cruiserweight champion, Chris Billum-Smith. Um, news of his vacation of the, uh, of the WB, not yet, Chris. Uh, the British cruiserweight title uh, came out today. Just talk to us about the reasoning and, and the kind of, I guess you would call it politics or, or whatever behind that decision. Well, it's a tough one. You know, we... we uh... You know, he's a European champion. He's got Turchi. We'd agreed to fight Turchi, and then the, the <laughs> you tricked me. The BBBFC um, ordered him to fight Mikel Lowell for the defenders his uh, British title. Two different pr promotional outfits. You've got Boxer that that have Lowell. You've got uh, Matchroom that, that have got CBS. So it was either going to go to purse bids, but. With Persby's going ahead, we might have had to fight within a certain time frame. Um, and Chris is defending his European against uh, against Turchi. Well, that's the fight that, that the EB have ordered. So, and that's the fight that we're making at the moment, uh, which is probably going to be going in, going on in like March, maybe April. Um, but yeah, it's like if you think about the old classical way, it's the Commonwealth and there's the British and then there's the European. Like you're not going to give up the European to defend the British, and you have to defend it four times outright to win it, four times to win it outright. Um, and yeah, I just think like we made the decision, we sat down, we discussed it, and it was like, look, that's the right thing to do. After the, this Turkey fight, we might have a guy sort of, sort of fringe fringe world level, but we want to be moving on to that scene, not going back to British. One of the fights that's been mentioned is obviously the Tommy McCarthy rematch. There was that fight last year at Fight Camp, a close fight, nip and tuck. Um, is that any of, of any interest to you potentially moving forward, a, a potential rematch with Tommy McCarthy? Definitely. I think it was a good fight. You know, f just for the TV, the TV are guaranteed another good fight. Tommy, um, yeah, he put up a good, good fight and, and, and um, it, he hurt Chris as well. So the fact that, that there's always going to be question marks when people say oh you know it was reasonably close fight and he hurt Chris but Chris outworked him won the fight convincingly but you know there's always that was Tommy 100% we want that for ourselves you know what I mean I want Chris to to, to beat him up and, and and knock him out in the return because he's more than capable he just didn't fight very well in that fight and he now knows he was downloading information you know and as the fight went on Chris was making it easier and easier and easier for himself so um and I think no matter what, he di he disrespected his power, and the shots that you, you know the shots that hurt you, the ones that you don't see, and that came from literally came from his ankles. So it was uh, you know he didn't drop him on out, but it was you know he was visibly hurt. So it would be interesting to see that in the in the rematch, and hopefully we could bring that fight back to Bournemouth because that's he he deserves a you know he went to Liverpool to box Craig Glover he's, he goes all over the place to box people and it, it would be nice for him to get a, a homecoming moving on to the scouse element of McGuigan's gym let's start with Robbie Davis Jr who had himself a very good win over hammering Hank Lundy who I think it's fair to say he's probably seen better days in his career it's called called time on his career since then but nonetheless he's back out of retirement already. is he back out of retirement already bloody That's hell about 20 days yeah, no, it was a. It lasted about twenty days, I think. So uh, um, he's he's sort of already come out of retirement, but it's just the way it is. You know, Demarcus Corley went on far too long, but that's what happens sometimes with these American fighters. They, whether they spend their dough when they're at the top, or or even fighting decent fights, getting good money, then they're trying to fight to get that money back, or they're trying to fight to get that status back. So um, great fight for Robbie. Just gone ten rounds as a Peter. And Robbie knocks him out in 
two rounds. So hurt him badly at the end of the first and knocked him out and through the ropes in the second. And uh, it, was a, it was a great win. That's why, that's why I was so excited to take that fight. A lot of people said, well, that was a hard fight for Robbie. To, you know, on the build-up to it, they were... I remember saying, I think Joe Gallagher said to my brother, he's like, oh, you know, fucking hell, it's a hard fight, that, that, that uh, Lundy. And he is a hard fight because he's... You know, he's got a decent bit of power. He's awkward and he's not he's not predictable. So, um, but at the same time, you have to take fights like that to get anywhere in the game. And uh, he, you know, he he could have made that hard work for himself, but caught him with a peach of a shot and and won it and, and knocked him out. And there's been a few discussions of we were trying to get somebody another big American name. Uh, we might have had to travel for it, but I think that's now unfortunately gone. Um, but but we'll be we're negotiating on Robbie's next fight at the moment. How pleased are you with him? Because obviously he's been at the gym a relatively short period of time. Um, yeah, he's long, sort of, yeah. s s with, with regards, certainly with regards to fights, yeah, yeah, so he's yeah. been in the gym longer than, than we've seen out on the, on the, what, in the ring. Uh, but how pleased are you with his development and how much more has he still got to give? I mean, like, he's been British, Commonwealth and European champion. At the end of the day, like, if he was to retire tomorrow, that's a, it's a huge achievement. Um, he's had some bad losses in terms of like he's taken his eye off the ball lost and then he lost to Ritzer and then he got beaten by the Mexican as well so it's like you know the only way we can go is up and I believe with the right matchmaking with the right technique improvement getting them right for spa instruction in camp properly um, making him a priority and making sure that everything's nailed in for his training and his preparation that suits him and his body then I think we've we've got a lot to to to, to give, you know. Um, I don't want him to fight guys that are sort of, you know, young killers that are at a lower level because sometimes you can fight guys like that. that and you take your eye off. Every everybody from now on in has to be someone that Robbie can get up for and he respects, you know, because he said to me the other day, he was saying like he was more nervous for Lundy than he was for the for the Mexican guy because he just hadn't heard of him but at least with Lundy he'd been in there with good good quality fighters he'd just gone 10 rounds with Zapida just thinking everyone's kind of writing me off and that's where we want Robbie to be because he needs to get up for them um, he needs to be matched well I'd love the Ritz in return I don't think it's ever going to happen but I would love it um, I think Robbie knocks him out but if we can't get fights like that then we go and get we get decent names um, and then we can hopefully either travel for them or, or bring them over and last but by no means least, Anthony Fowler. Um, of course, last time we saw him in the ring, got stopped by Liam Smith in that all Liverpool derby. Has since moved up to middleweight, um, oh, middleweight or superman away. Um, how is Mr. Fowler? He was knocking about a while ago, so I, I delayed asking this question till he politely moved. Yeah. Um, how is he? And well, first of all, going back to that night, uh, Liam Smith, a disappointing night at the office for him. Yeah, it was a disappointing night, uh, but it was also a lot of lessons learned. You know. Certain people can sort of cut weight and, and um, everyone lo always looks for an advantage when it comes to boxing, you know, whether it's a small bit of gloves or whether it's a little bit extra on the weight cut. And I think with, with, with Anthony, I think he was looking for an advantage for weight for a long time. You know, he came out of the Olympics at 75 kilos and he thought, I'll go down to, rather than go down to middleweight, which would have been much more comfortable, he decided to go down to, to light middleweight. And, and sometimes until you're tested, you don't know those things. You don't know how you feel because it's a skilled sport, right? So when you're miles better than somebody, you're not getting tested from a physicality standpoint because it's a skilled sport. But then he's, he matched somebody that was on his skill level and, you know, who's also been a world champion, would be a, ahead of his skill level. And the most important thing was there was a... It was a there was a massive energy uh, drop when it comes to his performance. You know, he was, he didn't know how much that weight was taken out of him until he boxed somebody of that level. And, and I think it's, you know, it's not, a, it's not a great situation to be in because he didn't, he didn't perform and he looked, he looked a shell of himself from what he's capable of. Um, but, you know, it's not like, it's not like there's miles on the clock. It's more the fact that he's, he was fried, he's fried at the weight, you know what I mean? And, and I don't know when they come in the gym, they're performing. But when they go home, I don't know how much they're eating because I don't live with everybody. I don't, 
I don't monitor every single drop of water and food that goes into their mouth. And, you know, he's such a lean character, like he's such a lean sort of physique that, um, you know, and, and that, that he had no reserve. So when, you know, when the energy bar dropped, he just had nothing left. So, we, you know, we're going to go potentially have this one at about 163, 164. But we'll see, um, we'll see how he performs. And, and once again, he's going to go back to a certain level, but we need to build it up. But then whenever he goes again to championship level, if he boxes someone like Felix Cash or guys in around British level, um, we need to make sure that, that he's, he's, not, you know, he's not fading down the stretch because of weight. Not having the, I mean, obviously at 154, he was a massive 154 pounder. I'm pretty sure he'll still be a fairly big middleweight, even though he's yeah. moved up. Um, but not having that additional physical advantage that he would have had at light middleweight, super welterweight, whatever you want to call it, how much of an impact do you expect that to have on him at 160 pounds? Say that again. So not having the, the physical advantages that he enjoyed at 154 pounds, how much of a detriment, if any, do you think that will be at middleweight? I don't, think, I don't think it's a big detriment because, he's still, as you say, he's still going to be a big middleweight. But it's going to be more down to the fact that He's he feels fresher, he feels sharper. Um, you know when you're when you're energised, and also you take a better shot when you're heavier. When you're cutting weight and you're down to zero percent body fat, and you've got you know you've got no reserve on you. Literally, you need a bit of fat, you need a bit of cushion to be able to like absorb punches. Um, so you can see certain big heavyweights that take on fantastic shots because they've got loads of surplus around them. You know what I mean? Um, and even fighters like George and stuff, like George used to be tight on the weight for a super middleweight, but he was still, he had weight on him. Mm. Yeah, you know I mean, he had a bit of flesh on him. He wasn't cut to the bone and chiseled. So um, it's, it's important to have that. I think middleweight's going to suit him. I, I, I think the fact that they're slightly slower as well, something that, that Fowler lacks is that little bit of speed because he's got loads of power, got very good timing. He just lacks that little bit of speed. And if you fight guys that are slightly slower, that everything's a bit more more relaxed you see things a little bit better he'll be the slightly faster person because he's moving up he's been used to boxing at slightly faster speed so i'm excited about it you know i think um he's still got so much to give in this sport and you know we have to we have to make sure that you know that he makes an impact up at middleweight when can we expect to see him in the ring i think he'll probably be on the undercard on february 27th so we're looking at that as a date Okay, quick, quick, quick AOB before we finish up. Um, we mentioned February the 5th, right at the very start of this interview, a couple of hours ago. Uh, Chris Eubank Jr. versus Liam Williams. How would you see that fight going? It's a good fight. Um, Liam Williams put a good show on against Andrade, but looked a bit, you know, looked fragile at times. Um, I think he was very square on. He's now with Adam Booth. I'm not sure how long they've had together. The fact that it's been pushed back a week is not really going to help them. Um, hopefully, they can get it on for February the fifth. Uh, I think, but I think Adam Booth's style is going to suit someone like Liam Williams because he's a good counter puncher. He's got naturally heavy hands, so um, that that could be a good that could be a good fit. Um, and Eubank, I think he's still with Roy Jones, isn't he? I don't think that's a good fit. Well, I don't think you know Eubank needs to. To not pot shot, not 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 sort of look for the eye catching shot. He's he's at his best when he's punching in combination, um, when he's fit and he's just durable. You know, you're not going to teach him to be, you know, some one punch knockout artist and you know, super slick and elusive because he's got he's got he's a good fighter, he's a good all rounder. But one of the biggest attributes that he's got is a fantastic chin. He can punch in combination and he can set a ridiculously high pace. So that moving back down to middleweight is, is helping him because he's had more physical attributes down there. But at the same time, he, um, you know, I think it, whoever the guy was that was working with him with um, uh, before the DeGale fight, I think that was a, Nate something, Nate. something like that. I can't remember. Nate Diaz, is it? Not no, Diaz. No, that's, that's the, the yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, I know who you mean. Uh, Apologies if he's watching. Yeah. Sorry about that. I don't want to call you Nate Diaz. Um, but, yeah, I think that was a good fit. I think, you know, I haven't been impressed with Eubank in the last couple of fights. Maybe that's maybe he's holding something back when he's boxing uh, Marcus Morrison or something. But he just looked a little bit, you know, he just didn't look himself. Um, but once again, that, that, that all draws down to <laughs> us as fans. It makes it exciting. Uh, but I think Eubank's going to have too much for him. I think he'll either probably stop him late. 
Tyson Fury versus Dillian White. If we see that fight, obviously we've seen the back and forth between the WBC, purse bids, this, that and the other. How do you see that fight happening if it does take place? Can't bet against Fury because he's, he, I mean, let's be honest, he is, he's the best heavyweight out there. Um, but I think someone like Usyk will give Fury a lot more problems because he's got good movement and he's, he's, he's not going to stand in front of you. But the people that are going to stand in front of him, right, will give him a hard fight. And that is Dylan White. He's going to stand in front of him. He's going to, he's not going to, I don't think he's going to win, but I think he's going to make it a physical fight, um, force, force Fury to, to have to, to work. But with that added weight on him, it'd be interesting to see how they approach the camp, whether they, they keep him heavy, Fury heavy, or they try and lighten him up for a little bit of movement and stuff. Uh, if it was me, I would try, I'd keep him heavy. I'd keep him, because he's got decent enough movement, but he's just got more on his shots when he's, at, when he's like 19, I think he's about 19, 19 and a half stone or something. So um, it'll, be, it'll be exciting whilst it lasts. Dylan White's no pushover. He doesn't keep winning, like if he, because he's, you know, he, he keeps winning because he's got something about him um, and he gives people hard fights because he's, because he's got a lot about him. It's one thing that he lacks is that punch resistant with one shot, you know, that one shot that Povetkin nailed him with, the one shot that, that AJ nailed him with. Do you think Tyson Fury has the punching power for that one shot? Not really. He's more of a wear you down sort of guy, hit you with jabs or hit you with solid right hands and then by round six and seven you're thinking, oh, they're starting to really hurt now because he's landed so many of them. Um, sorry, but that's it's it's a it's an exciting fight. I I'm ex I'm actually really excited about it because Dylan always comes to fight. But I think yeah I think Tyson will will, will get him. But it'll probably either be be late or late or maybe even points. But it won't be an easy fight. And final question of the day: If you could make one fight for Canelo Alvarez this year, and you're not allowed to say Lawrence Coley or Chris Billingsworth or Anthony Fowler, um, who would you make and why? Canelo Al Alvarez, yeah, better buy of or better be of, because um, he's the he's the man at 175. Bivol's a, a very good fighter at 175. I just don't think Bivol will. Yeah, still, I mean, Bivol will still give him a really good fight. He, he's just not established. People don't know him as much as they know better buy of, and he's had better wins. He's at, he's 17 and 0, I think, with 17 knockouts. That's the one people want to see. Alvarez, in my opinion, knocks him out because Beterbiev Bet is very heavy-handed, but he's also really tired that weight, and he's like 35, maybe even 36 years of age. He went up to 91s as an amateur in 2012 um, because he couldn't do 81s on the day. The weight will be taking a lot out of him. And, you know, Callum Johnson able to, was able to drop him. I think he dropped, got dropped as well in one of the other fights. So, Jeff Page. Yeah, Jeff Page. So... You know, Canelo is not going to be a massive puncher at 175, but what he is is he's got such good movement and and he's got such a good chin that he'll tire people out, and I think he'll probably he'll probably stop him. But at the same time, it'll be it's the one to, it's the, that would be the one that we want to see. Big call to say stop him, but yeah, it's the one that we want to see for sure. Uh, final word with you. Asked everybody the questions today, so I'm going to end it with you. Mm -hmm. How does 2022 look like for Shane McGuigan and McGuigan's gym? What can we expect to see when we do this interview this time next year? What are we going to be talking about? More world champions. Lawrence will be a well, he'll probably be a unified world champion. Um, Ellie Scott will be a world champion. Um, Daniel Dubois might be a regular world champion, I would hope. People are picking up other belts. Um, CBS defended his belt. Robbie's moved on. He's probably, you know, hopefully had a couple of big fights, maybe even lined himself up to fight for a vacant belt when Josh Taylor, if he, if or when he moves on and vacates. Um, might have another prospect in the gym. So I want a lot, a lot, a lot, of, uh, a lot of fights, a lot of wins. As everyone knows, I'm always trying to push for my fights to have decent fights. But obviously fights that we, we're confident of winning, but, you know, it's... Uh, it's an entertainment business and um, yeah, I think, I ho hope that no more people come through the door because <laughs> nine or 10 still, it's a lot of fighters, but I hope that everyone stays and, and, and we get the most out of people. So that's, that's, what I wanna, that's what I want for 2022. And lots of interviews with Boxing Social. Exactly.
There we go. Uh, first one back. It's been a long one. As always, real pleasure. Thanks very much for having me and the team down at McGuigan's gym today. Shane McGuigan, always a pleasure. Thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social, and we'll catch up with you soon. Cheers, Rob. Thanks as always, mate. Nice to see you. <laughs>